Hi everyone, and welcome to Trader Corporation's video panel on COVID-19 and the impact on the automotive industry and specifically dealerships here in Canada. Uh, I hope this message and video finds you all safe and well. And today I'm being joined by three of my colleagues from Trader Corporation uh, who are gonna be answering some of the questions that you've put to us uh, through social media and email over the past couple of days regarding your business, uh, the outlook of the industry, and all kinds of other good stuff. We're recording this video on Friday the 27th of March, and it's important to note that because, of course, with the situation, uh, things are changing by the hour and by the day. Um, and in fact, just as we're recording this, uh, we were just learning about the government announcement um, to subsidise wages uh, around 75% for small Canadian-controlled uh, businesses. So. Things are moving very fast, but uh, we're going to speak to the situation as best we can uh, with the knowledge that's available at this point in time. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our panel that we have here today. So first up, we have Jody Gill. Jody is VP of Sales Operations at Trader Corporation. Uh, he's been working in the corporate environment as a sales leader for 20 years at Trader. He has worked in many different areas of our business. And currently, he's overseeing the efficiency and effectiveness of the sales teams. And he does that by creating, evaluating, and optimizing data sets and sales applications. Hello, Jody, how are you doing? Hi, Ian, I'm doing well. So, and next up we have Matt Lawson. Matt is VP of Dealer Software and OEM. Uh, he's worked and lived inside the automotive business his entire life, and he has worked professionally with Trader Corporation for over 15 years. So Matt is a car guy. Uh, Matt's got a deep understanding of dealership operations, uh, and the software that dealers can use to power the more functional areas of the business. And for Trader, Matt leads all tier three programs with OEM partners uh, as well. Hello, Matt, how are you doing? Thanks, Ian, doing great. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Good stuff. And then we also have Nuno Lorero. Nuno is Director of Data Intelligence at Trader Corporation. Uh, he leads the Data Tribe. Um, and Nuno is actually the man behind match reporting, which many of you will be familiar with, our attribution system for uh, drawing a line between investment in the marketplace, autotrader.ca, and actual vehicle sales. And also the retail price index, which you'll be familiar with, which gets featured in the Globe and Mail and on CP24 and elsewhere uh, in the media every month, where we measure uh, what's happening with new and used vehicle prices uh, across the country. Uh, Nuno has over six years automotive experience and almost 20 years of experience uh, in data and business intelligence. Hello, Nuno. Hey, thanks for having me. No problem. And lastly, I'm Ian McDonald. I'm Vice President of uh, Strategic Marketing at Trader Corporation, uh, overseeing uh, a number of different marketing functions and ensuring synergy with uh, corporate objectives. So thanks very much for joining me today, guys. Uh, and I'm going to get straight into the questions here. So right off the top, uh, here's a question from, from one of our customers. Will this situation have least lasting impacts on the way that people buy cars in Canada? Uh, could this uh, accelerate digital retailing, for example, permanently? So could this kind of fast forward you know, the process that I think a lot of us in the industry um, felt was kind of happening bit by bit anyway with this move towards e-commerce and digital retailing? Um, and I think uh, maybe Matt will go to you firstly on that one. Yeah, sure. And, you know, I think that, Ian, that's a great question from dealers to have, you know, given the market dynamics and how quickly things have evolved just literally in, in two weeks. But, but before, you know, maybe I speak about the current state, if we just look back over the last three to five years, this has been a theme that has been evolving. And, you know, we've seen different products enter the market. And the, the ways that those products improve the dealership operation and maybe more importantly, improve the customer experience, that shift has already begun. And, you know, so, you know, when we think about all of the different trade shows, whether it's NADA, digital dealer, or driving sales, or the ACE conference down in Niagara Falls that the TADA does a great job of putting on, um, and, and various trade shows, the, the Western Canadian Dealer Summit uh, uh, in Western Canada. These are all 
all shows that have been talking about this subject matter for the last number of years. And it's only really a matter of time until dealers will start to adopt digital retailing inside their operation. At Trader, we really look at this in two different ways. There's, there's two adoption curves. There's the consumer adoption curve and there's the dealer adoption curve. And what we've seen over the last year since we launched our instant cash offer product on the autotrader.ca marketplace is the willingness of the consumer to participate in some of the transactional process in a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. And so that is sort of the first indicator for us at Trader that suggests that the consumer is absolutely willing to engage in that transactional workflow online. Um, but I think perhaps the maybe more important adoption curve is the dealer and the dealer's ability to augment their sales process inside their dealership. And this is where the rubber meets the road with digital retailing products that are in the market. There are all kinds of different suppliers out there, and I think all of them are fantastic tools for dealers. Truly, I believe that. And all of them also improve the experience for the consumer, and, and I think that that's great. But when a dealer is looking to break down differences between different options available to them in this space, the way that we look at it is there is that online to offline seamless connectivity of working the transaction in the deal which is critically important and making sure that the product that you're evaluating facilitates each section of the purchase whether it's build and price oem programs conditional non-conditional stackable non-stackable incentives available by the car maker but then f and i products so what protection plans, accessories, and warranties are you trying to sell people inside your dealership in your business office? Then the trade-in function, you know, and the process that dealers move through in trade. Then, of course, you've got credit and lender approvals, captive, non-captive. Uh, and, and so these are different elements of digital retailing tools that are very important. Now, having said that, some tools are modularized and others are more comprehensive and inclusive. That's the first piece that needs to be evaluated by the dealers. What components are you, are you willing to augment inside your store and move into a virtual environment? What tools are able to facilitate each of the elements that I just described? Secondly, the ability for the consumer to go from offline to online. And let me explain what I mean by that. In a normal course of business, dealers have lots of traffic inside their showroom, people at the sales desk, folks out on test drives, and we're working deals in the store. Okay, that's the normal course of automotive retail business. And what's been missing is the ability for those consumers to initiate that physical transaction in the store, but go home at the end of it and complete that transaction online in a virtual environment. Let's now, test install, uh, experience map. Say that one again, I just missed that, Ian. So that's the kind of, uh, the kind of experience that I'm doing in my Tesla has been uh, adopting. And you're trying to kind of push through where you, you go for a test drive, but you know, the sales people aren't commissioned, they actually push you back online to go and transact yourself bingo exactly and you know so there's already some the likes of tesla that have excelled in this space at doing this and you know if you look just cross retail sectors at you know try to think of a retail sector that has not yet digitized the transactional process mm -hmm. one of the most recent retail sectors that i think has done a phenomenal job with it is grocery, right? And now think about the current environment that we're in and how useful those tools are for us to be able to get groceries and food and necessities into our homes 
without having to worry about putting ourselves in harm's way and going into a physical environment where we're nervous about the virus, right? So, you know, the expectation of the consumer has already been shaped. The automotive sector needs to catch up. And there's so many tools available for dealers out there in order to do that. It's just a matter of assessing each tool, how it can complement their process. And then, as I was mentioning, perhaps more importantly, how they're going to augment their process in the store to complement the tool and the experience for the end user. Uh -huh. And uh, you make a good point about the, the groceries and stuff like that. You know, when we think about adoption curves for new technology and different ways of doing stuff, I mean, uh, although it's not quite comparable, obviously the size of the purchase and whatnot, but you look at stuff like Uber and, and how quickly it's almost like exponential that that just becomes the normal way that you get around if, if you don't have a vehicle kind of thing. Um, whereas, you know, and it's been said many times, getting in people's strangers' cars would have been unthinkable. But then that comes along, the technology works. So I think with the digital retailing thing, I mean, all the research that we've done in, in the past that we're currently doing on consumer appetite for this stuff shows exactly as you said, that, you know, it's as many as like half of consumers right now are like, I'm, I'd am i be feeling pretty good about starting a transaction online or having this seamless experience. So I'm ready for that. And as you said, I mean, going through something like this, Part of it depends on how long the isolation and the distancing measures last, but um, you've got to think that's only going to increase through this. And so in terms of is it going to accelerate permanently, I think on the consumer side, almost certainly, if this thing kind of goes on, and that's going to create a situation where dealers kind of have to do too, because they have to keep up with that. That's just how the consumer wants to transact. They have to start offering that, right? In the free market, that's how it works. They, they will start offering that. Yeah, you know, maybe just like to add to that comment that you just made about, you know, their the shaped expectations the, you know, automotive retail for decades has been plagued with the unfortunate stigma from the consumer over not being trusted. And, you know, that's unfortunate in so many ways because uh, I come from an automotive family. Grandfather was a car dealer. You know, my dad works in the automotive business. He owns a retail operation. And, uh, you know, all of us know that that is just not true. And, you know, the, the, these tools that are available in market now for dealers, the digital retailing solutions that are out there, they provide the transparency that the consumer is looking for when they're building deals, right? Whether it's in the store or online, it breaks down how the programs work and it shows them the options that they have available. Do they want to lease? Do they want to finance? Do they want bi-weekly? Do they want monthly? Do they want weekly? Do they want a 72 month term, a 48 month term? And they can see as they're moving through these different options that are available to them, how it affects the payment that ultimately they're going to be obliged to to commit to and you know I, that is something that the consumer has never had because it, it used to be in the conventional automotive retail sales process the consumer came in looking for a vehicle and the the sales process in the store was positioned around trying to put somebody into a vehicle that was in the range of what their budget affordability was, um, but not necessarily disclosing all of the options that were available to them. And then thus compounds that stigma. So, you know, yes, we've got market conditions and we need to offer tools to dealers so that they can operate in this environment. But at the same time, the consumer has been demanding it from us anyway. So to your point, I think it accelerates where this is going. That's great, thank you, Matt. Um, okay, so Jody, uh, I think I'd like to come to you next with this question. And so, um, obviously in the very short term, uh, we just want to talk a little bit more about the longer term, but in the short term, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, how dealerships can um, sell in a more remote way or, or remotely, uh, dropping off cars for test drives, um, similarly with documents, you know, virtual walk-arounds, 
uh, or vehicles, things like that. So this idea of sort of selling remotely, which is maybe not sort of, you know, full-blown digital retailing, it's, it, it's more like uh, the more traditional process, but being done remotely. Um, this question here is what kind of changes to my sales training do I need to make to ensure that my employees can sell remotely, but they can still close deals under these new kind of conditions? I just wondered what your take was on that. Yeah, so thanks for having me, uh, Ian. And firstly, before I answer that question, it's a great question. I just want to ensure that uh, everyone is safe and healthy and remain that way, those of you who are watching. And uh, uh, in terms of answering that question, I think there's four key areas that you really want to focus in on. One is, do does your staff understand your online presence? You know, are they going through your inventory? Do they really understand what your value proposition is? The second part is, is your staff educated on the new processes and uh, business rules you've put in place to really support our new reality, which is being able to support consumers in the way that they want to be supported or interacted with. So for instance, going back to what Matt said, if you're putting new tools in place, such as digital retailing, um, does your staff really understand how that works and is, is your staff able to um, have that conversation and communicate that with the with the consumer when they're talking to them. I think the third area is really helping your staff understand the um, response times and having them respond to consumers very quickly when they do reach out. And then also having a follow up process in place um, to ensure that, you know, you're not only contacting that consumer once, but you're you're reaching back out to that consumer and really answering any questions that they might have or educating them back to point two of the tools that you have in place. So I think as a business, it's also important to put in those KPIs in place and really tracking, um, you know, how many consumers are coming, coming into us and having communication with us. How quickly are we responding to them? And, uh, and how many times are we following up with that consumer as they're in their consideration phase? And I think the fourth area that really um, you should train, that dealers should train their staff on is really understanding the consumer's needs um, through a lot of discovery questions in terms of what types of vehicles are they looking for? How long have they been in market? What are some of the attributes that they loved about their vehicle? Why are they moving into a new vehicle and considering a new vehicle? Um, and how would that, that consumer wanna be serviced moving forward in terms of test drives, um, in terms of financing, uh, in terms of delivery of a vehicle. So I think those four areas are the key areas that, that really you should be training your staff on um, to have them prepared for what this new reality is going to be because they're not gonna be in their showroom waiting for consumers to walk in. They're going to be um, virtually communicating with their consumers, right? So it's more important to really understand a consumer's mindset. 100%. That's, that's great insight. Thanks, Jody. Um, <clears throat> next question. Uh, okay, I think uh, maybe this is one for me. Uh, what are you doing to keep consumer traffic on autotrader.ca? Okay, um, so uh, in the short term, uh, obviously, you know, we have seen a slight softening uh, in terms of the metrics on our site. Um, you know, and I can share that. Uh, sessions, for example, it's, it's reduced from the rate that it was pre-COVID by around 15%. Um, to be honest, that's not as bad as uh, I might have expected. It still means that there's, you know, every day there's sort of almost half a million uh, visits to the marketplace going on. Um, and so that's interesting to us because, you know, it indicates that the consumers are still interested in, in cars uh, and they're still sort of somewhat in the market. I think um, possibly what it signals is that, yeah, they're just going to be in the research phase a little bit longer um, because of what's happening with COVID and obviously with various provincial shutdowns. It's, it's going to impact to some degree their ability to actually transact in the short term. But the demand is sort of certainly still there uh, because they're still consuming BDPs and they're still engaged with the site. Now, from a marketing standpoint, obviously, uh, you know, in normal conditions, we're running a kind of marketing machine. You'll see us on TV all the time, paid search and a number of other things. You know, we're in the press a lot through PR. And so we're always attracting more and more uh, news into the marketplace. Now, during this time, uh, I think in general, uh, what the strategy is going to be is, is probably focusing in a little bit more on sort of the lower funnel kind of users that are 
still willing or need to transact, they can't delay it, they, they can't be stuck in that research phase. So I think possibly some uh, some changes in there around um, the way that we target users, especially using digital. That's probably the way we're gonna play this uh, for the next kind of couple of weeks. And like every other kind of answer in, in this webinar, it's, um, or in this video, sorry, it's, it's really dependent on how long the virus kind of lasts, how we react to it. And that's what makes it so challenging for us, the same as it's challenging um, for anybody that's watching is that everything hinges on how well we're able to tackle this virus here in Canada kind of thing. So I think the other thing that I'd highlight is that uh, Auto Trader is, is the biggest marketplace uh, in terms of size, but also in terms of unaided top of mind awareness and, and kind of saliency. Uh, so in the moment where people need a car, they do think of Auto Trader sort of far more than they do um, any other marketplace. In fact, so two thirds of the traffic that we have on the marketplace arrives at us with us organically. Um, which is obviously built by you know, previous marketing investments in previous years building that brand. So two thirds of the traffic will come to us direct or, or kind of they'll search for the brand on Google and things like that. We don't have to rely on buying it sort of in that in that moment. Um, so even if we spent nothing, you know, over two thirds of the traffic would still be there. Um, so as much as I think I can say at this point, because as I say, like, like everyone else, it's, it's really sort of changing uh, day to day and week to week. Um, so the next question, uh, what do you anticipate uh, when the situation improves? How can dealers prepare for the first day after a lockdown if they are experiencing a provincial lockdown? But I think this question extends to the virus overall. At some point, we are going to be recovering from this. Uh, what kind of opportunities might arise as we come out of the recovery phase of this? And, and what could dealers be doing uh, now to kind of make use of that downtime and, and be prepared? Um, so, uh, I think Matt or Jody, if you want to speak to that one. I think you're muted. Never fails. I always forget that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got a few thoughts that I'll share. And then, you know, Jody, feel free to uh, to chime in here. But, um, you know, well, I think dealers over the next few weeks are in this downtime period it's an opportunity for them to do a few things. They've got inventory sitting on their lot. And, uh, you know, whether they have moved to a appointment only based strategy or are shut down entirely, uh, that inventory still remains on their lot and is still something that they're going to want to move quickly when they resume a normal course of business. So um, things like the detailing, what is the physical state of that inventory right now? How many test drives has it been on since since the inventory has been in stock? Um, you know, and just having folks who are left in the dealership go through and make sure that that inventory physically is pristine. Uh, and then virtually, you know, go through, take the time, look at all your descriptions, match up the descriptions with the attributes on the vehicle and make sure that we are articulating the value proposition of that particular vehicle in the right way to those who might be online because they need to be. Uh, but at least at a minimum, when the market does return, you're not caught doing that work in a reactionary measure. You've got the time now, focus on it. Um, and then, you know, the notion of just sweeping through your website, right? In some cases, dealers don't have the time to pay attention to this stuff. So are we looking at the meta descriptions on each of the pages on their site so that when those pages rank on Google and the organic search, what is the description of the page? What is the intent that uh, that searcher might be looking for? And are we matching the description with the intent? These are things that dealers can spend a little bit of time on while the, the floor traffic in the showroom is, is relatively quiet or non-existent and clean this stuff up, you know, because the reality is we could probably look across 100% of dealers in the whole entire world and find some stuff to improve, right? So um, I think, you know, they, they should be working on that stuff now and you know hopefully you know we get back to a normal course of business in the next couple of weeks so that when they do open the door you know we're ready to get back to doing things that dealers love doing every day which is buying cars putting you know trades on vehicles negotiating deals setting delivery times 
and the things that really matter for their business. Yeah, on that point, Jody, you know, I think I'd like to ask you. So, um, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is that, uh, as I mentioned, kind of even during this time, the, the marketplace is still bustling. And something that surprised me is that uh, it's not all just research. Yeah, there's still hundreds of thousands of leads going through the marketplace out to dealer customers. Um, and, you know, for those either provinces that are in shutdown or, you know, uh, the consumer's not comfortable leaving the house or, or you know, whatever it might be, what are kind of like the, the different approach, I guess, to kind of servicing that lead that a dealer should take sort of during this time, um, when obviously they're prevented from the usual course of business, which would be let's have a chat, you know, come to the dealership, whatever. Um, how can they keep those leads, uh, keep nurturing those leads kind of through the period so that, you know, when we get to the other side of this, you know, they, they could actually wind up with a kind of a ready to go list of really warm prospects who send leads. Yeah, I think I think the mindset that dealers need to have is that, uh, once that lead is sent in and you have that initial contact with that consumer, don't assume that just because they didn't buy from you on that day or they didn't give you some buying signals that they're still not in the market to buy a vehicle. So it's important to follow up with that customer and have a process in place where, you know, maybe the first three times that you contact the customer, it's all about inquiring about that specific vehicle and asking questions of, of whether, um, you know, where they're at in that, in that decision making. But then after those three contacts about informing the consumer on you know different changes in the market, um, updates on pricing for that vehicle. So I think it's important to, to keep in contact with that consumer so that you can really gain trust with that consumer, that you're that you're invested in their in their experience of buying a new vehicle, whether that's you know tomorrow or two months from now, um, when possibly things go back to uh, normal operations. Yeah, that's Okay, thank you guys. Um, so the next question. Uh, so with a limited number of wholesale transactions due to the closure of physical auctions, is there any way to accurately determine the percentage of used inventory devaluation that has occurred since coronavirus became a large factor? Uh, so essentially, you know, what's happening with kind of pressure and pricing, particularly uh, in used and I think um, Nuno will be interesting uh, to hear from you in terms of what you're seeing in the, in the data uh, but Matt I mean do you have anything from your just your experience of the industry on what this might be what's likely to be happening because of that closure of physical auctions? You know it's uh, that's the real question here guys I mean the, the sadly the answer from a wholesale perspective is that it, we don't know at the moment, right? Because the the number of transactions in a wholesale environment has for all intents and purposes stopped. I mean, I can't think of it. I haven't spoken to any dealers that I know that are buying cars right now. Um, and if there are some, it's it's likely not a lot. So the volume of transactions in the wholesale environment determine the demand and therefore the price. So it's a great question, you know, what is going to happen to the wholesale valuation, uh, you know, on the on the other side of this thing. Having said that, you know, our view is always to look at it from a retail point of view and understand what's happening in the live market on the retail side of the business as a function of determining what you should do from a wholesale perspective. So I, I would encourage dealers to continue to look through that lens as a first measure. The auctions eventually will pick up. The wholesale market will likely change in terms of the wholesale values. But, you know, in terms of trying to understand what to do on a car or what, you know, how to determine whether or not you're holding water against your current inventory or not, um, you know, I think you should look at that through a retail point of view. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Nuno uh, being a data guy and data expert for our business, probably better to speak to what's happening on the retail side. Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. Um, I've been uh, kind of crunching some numbers here just on the used car side of the business. And, and this is uh, essentially the same, uh, the same data that really kind of powers our retail uh, price index. Uh, and uh, to be honest, on the used car side of things, we, we haven't really seen too much of a drop in, in uh, the average price of a vehicle. Um, now, why this is, that's, that's difficult to say, Matt, as, as kind of you've, um, you've alluded to. 
uh, it's difficult to understand the impact that uh, the the, the COVID-19 um, issue has had on, on vehicle prices. Um, but spe specifically speaking to the data that we're seeing, we don't see too much of a drop off um, on the, the used car or the new car side of, of things. So um, one thing that is a little bit interesting to note is, is um, this is uh, about the time where we start to see uh, more ads coming through the system. So I'd be curious to see what happens next month with with the uh, the uptick in in the the typical uptick in the uh, the spring market um, and and what impact this uh, this this whole uh, scenario has has kind of on that. So um, as of right now, we we we're not seeing too much of a drop off, um, but it could just be because of low volumes. Um, so if if dealers are out there and they're making changes, uh, unless we really start seeing a large majority of dealers do that. Um, it's not going to come through in our data. So uh, as of now, prices are still staying relatively stable, um, but um, obviously uh, no. time will tell what, what it looks like next month. Yeah, we've got, we've got a little ways to go, I guess, for it to flush through. And speaking of that, Nuno, on the inventory side of things, I mean, um, presumably there's a little bit less metal actually moving and uh, uh, we're kind of seeing like, like inventory is kind of ticking up a little bit on the site as this, as this flushes through. I mean, I know, it feels like it's been a lifetime, but it's only been kind of yeah. what is it, two weeks since this whole thing kicked off. Yeah, no, I mean, in terms of uh, just overall volumes on the set, I mean, it's 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 kind of sticking to what we were we, we would expect to see. Um, we're not seeing as many delistings, so as many ads obviously being delisted and, and new ads kind of taking place uh, or taking their place. So um as of right now i mean it, it looks like from a data perspective there hasn't been too much change again i suspect that's just because there's not a lot of activity happening um but uh yeah i mean i, I would say that uh, we've noticed a trend obviously in in the past and, and we've alluded to it in the retail price index uh, that we do see a composition change so the number of trucks versus suvs versus sedan so sedan's obviously taking a little bit of a hit there um, but it looks like that's obviously an overall industry trend. Um, but aside from that, um, we haven't seen too much in the data suggesting that, uh, again, prices are, are are being depressed or inventory is being depressed, aside from the fact that we're not seeing as much um, movement in terms of, of, um, of vehicles. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. And uh, I just wanted to say at this point that uh, anyone who's watching this, do be sure to, uh, to follow us on uh, LinkedIn and the like, because as uh, we do notice more trends, as, as the thing become more established, we'll be sharing some of those insights through those channels. So uh, if you're interested in getting those insights, do uh, do engage with us and follow us on primarily LinkedIn, uh, but also uh, Facebook and elsewhere. Okay, uh, just moving along here, um, cost of time a little bit. So uh, there's a question here, and then Jody, I think I'd like your thoughts on this one. Um, what is the best way for a dealership during COVID-19 outbreak to maintain their presence online um, and most crucially, what type of information should dealers share with their consumers to maintain that reputation and, and kind of demonstrate value? So changes to messaging, I'm thinking, is, is what we're talking about here. Yeah, so I think it's an important, as Matt mentioned, that first the first step is ensuring that your inventory that's on the ground on your lot is showroom ready. And then it's all about merchandising that inventory online. So step one is, you know, be present in the market. Make sure your inventory is there when consumers are in the research phase or, or their consideration phase um, as they're sitting at home and, and online um, on different marketplaces or websites. Um, and so for you to be present, you also need to make sure your inventory is up to date. You know, are you competitively priced? Are you uh, merchandised in terms of images? And do you have descriptions on your vehicle now? You know, uh, describe a vehicle, what's unique about a vehicle, a particular vehicle. And, and if there's nothing unique that you can mention about that vehicle, then what's your value proposition as, as a business, right? Why should people come and shop with you? And that's where you start adding in, you know, what you can do for a consumer in this new reality in terms of test drives. That's when you can start adding in information around what tools you have available at the consumer's fingertips while they're sitting at home researching your vehicles. Um, and then also a message around, you know, that they, they can contact uh, virtually uh, to the business and be able to have a discussion with a salesperson if they have any additional questions. So I think that entire process is really important, um, but it all starts with having your inventory present. 
um, what, and, and you've made that decision to have it present, then it's about keeping it up to date. And I would recommend that you should be going in and looking at your inventory on a daily basis and ensuring that it's competitively priced number one, right? In terms of consumers' behavior online when they're researching for a vehicle, that isn't going to change. That's going to be based on, are you competitively priced? Can you showcase the inventory through the images and give someone a clear understanding of what that vehicle looks like outside and inside? Can you describe that vehicle in a way that makes it unique and uh, desirable for a consumer? And then do you, are you able to give consumers tools to allow them to a, interact with you and allow them to interact with the vehicle as well in a test drive environment or when they decide to purchase the vehicle? And that day, way you will set yourself up to ensure that you know, when things do go back to what they used to be like or to back to some sort of normality, that you're able to service those customers very quickly and you're not losing ground to your competitors because you never, because you made the decision to remove your inventory from the consideration set. That's a, that's a great point, Jody. And um, actually, it kind of leads us nicely into uh, the next question, which I think we all kind of maybe have a view on. Uh, is it worth spending marketing dollars on digital paid media? I guess I would expand that to sort of any, any media um, to promote uh, dealership services during the COVID-19 outbreak. So uh, from the wording of that question, I guess promote dealership services is what you were talking about, Jody. So if, if, if you are and you should be still gaining exposure for your vehicles, yes, absolutely. Front and center value proposition should be the specific services that you're offering that are hyper relevant at this time more so than you know perhaps what your value proposition might have been a few weeks ago um but i guess to kind of expand that like you know uh, and i guess I'll, I'll give a quick thought and then hand it to you guys should dealers be spending marketing dollars right now i mean i think yes fundamentally the demand is still there not you know we can see that in our marketplace but not just that we can also see through google and other places that there's, there's still demand people are still searching for vehicles they might not be buying them today, they may be buying them today, they might not, they might be buying them later, but that demand is there. I think as you were just alluding to there, Jody, that the idea of kind of completely cutting off all of your exposure uh, does seem um, like it, it could be a, a bit of a reaction that actually is gonna forego some value that you could be getting during this time, whether it is building up like a, a prospect of warm leads or actually there are cars still being sold. If you're able to be selling remotely, you could still be transacting uh, and moving some cars. Um, so I think in, in principle, yes. And then, and then I would say uh, um, similar to sentiments that you've expressed, Matt, it's all about kind of being selective. And that's the standard course of business. Anyway, I would say is that you know, dealers are using marketplace or your you Google advertising or your Facebook you need to be holding those partners to account, asking them for attribution methods. Also, the responsibility is on the, the dealer. We are also advertisers. The responsibility is on the advertiser to hold partners to account and um, do the analysis around cost of BDP and vehicles sold. You know, that's why we develop Match, because dealers challenge us. How many cars are you really selling for me? I'd extend the same thing. Um, I'd, I'd advise the same kind of approach with other vendors. So being selective in that way, we should always be selective with our advertising dollars, but it's just now more than ever. Um, I don't know if you guys also have a view on, on should dealers be spending through this time? And, and sure, sure. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Ian. I think that, you know, the business reality is that, you know, as a business, you might not be able to, you're not in a position to spend as much as you were before. So I think it's really critical for you to understand the efficiency of your marketing dollars, right? So how do you, how do you assess the efficiency of your marketing dollar? Well, the first step is, what's your cost for VDP on different areas where you're advertising, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to assess that because then you can compare apples to apples across all media spend that you have. Right. And then the second step is once you understand that is, okay, what were the results of, of in terms of cars sold? Were those different marketing dollars um, helping you achieve, right? And so when you take those two KPIs, you can easily say, all right, let's prioritize from one to five where we want to be spending our money. Where's the first place where we want to make sure that we're present? Right. And I think each business needs to go in and, and assess that um, and partner with their with their different av advertising partners and understand that and ask those questions to ensure they're making smart decisions um, in, in the short term while we while we experience this um, something that we've never experienced before. Right. Right. And I guess uh, just thinking about it, there's other factors like the actual media format. Right. So 
just like what you were saying, now is the time to be telling different stories, different messages, talking about you know delivery and, and this kind of stuff. Something like um, uh, you know Google Search, there's a character limit. It's very hard to sort of tell that story and get that value proposition across in, in search. But you know something like Facebook advertising, you can leverage video, more copy. Similarly, a marketplace, you've got the whole description field to play with, uh, and there's other ways to, to tell that story. So. I guess it's like uh, exactly the same. It's that combination of kind of the efficiency piece, and then also what's logical. Like, like what are the media formats that are going to enable me to tell the message I need to tell right now? Absolutely. Okay, so um, so we're coming to the end here. Last question is a pretty broad one, but um, I'm interested to get everybody's views. So, so uh, the question is, what are you seeing from markets like China, which sort of look to be recovering? So I guess we're trying to predict what you know recovery might look like in other markets such as ours. What is the longer term industry outlook? So I guess I'll share a little bit of perspective myself. A trader corporation, we're fortunate to have um, you know friends at other car marketplaces uh, internationally um, in other markets. And so um, we do have the ability to kind of uh, compare and, and understand kind of more global trends and how people are thinking about things. Now, you know, from what I've seen, uh, the data that comes out of Google, actually, the the recovery of demand in China has been quite slow and steady. It hasn't kind of snapped right back. Um, so I don't think we should expect anything along those lines. Um, so it will be a kind of slow and steady recovery. Uh, and I, I think that the, the outcome of this is going to be largely dependent on how we manage the virus and how successful we are with that. Um, bottom line, the longer that the virus remains an issue and, and the longer that we have self-isolation and other measures, the bigger impact it's going to have on the economy. I think what's key is how much damage is done to the underlying economy through this whole thing. If next week something happens around a, a cure or something like this, you know, then, it, then not too much damage has been done despite uh, all of those really unfortunate kind of layoffs across the country that we've seen now up in the millions uh, just last week. But yeah, those jobs will come back, the employment rate will go back, it's less underlying damage. The longer it goes on, we start damaging the, the, the foundation of the economy, then obviously it's going to have more impact. And um, you know, I was looking at some data just back at sort of 2008, uh, and it looks like kind of historically, when we've entered these kind of recessions and times like this, uh, the used car market has been a lot more resilient than the new car market. Uh, so I think that's something to look out for um, as well. But that was kind of my learning from just taking a look around. I mean, I'm interested in your guys' opinion on sort of longer term for the industry. And of course, it is a bit of a piece of string because it's all dependent on this thunderbolt that's come out of nowhere and how long it goes on. But wh where's your head at in terms of longer term industry outlook? I'll start with you, Matt, perhaps. Yeah. Hey. Uh, yeah. So, you know, um, in 2008, um, I remember quite vividly different conversations I was having face to face with dealers during that period. And I remember the challenges that they were faced with and the pain uh, that they were experiencing inside their operation and, you know, in their personal lives. Uh, but one thing that I did learn through going through that cycle is that car makers and car retailers are some of the most resilient business operators on the face of the earth. They really and truly are. Um, this virus is not going to take down the automotive sector. It's not going to take down some retail. It's not going to take down the car makers. And it's not going to take down the, the spirit of the car dealer. Sure, it might be challenging for certain car dealers to make their way through, but they will get through it. And, you know, uh, we don't know what is going to happen in the North American and the Canadian market on the other side of this thing. You know, we can look at the indicators from China, um, you know, but what I think dealers really need to stay focused on is that on any given month, they're paying tens of thousands of dollars per month to hold inventory. And that inventory needs to move. And we know definitively that there's still literally millions of Canadians who are clicking on cars. So if dealers just stay focused on making sure that their inventory is available for consumption, eventually every car reaches a probabilistic range of selling after a certain amount of engagement online, they will get through it. They just need to stay focused and as you mentioned earlier, you know, and as Jody mentioned, look for efficiency. 
right? Uh, the reality is that they have less dollars to spend today and that's okay. Just make sure that you're spending it in a way that's gonna have a meaningful impact on your business. Yeah, Matt, what I would add to that as well is uh, I think now is a great opportunity to be judged on on what matters most, right? Um, so looking at car sales and and to uh, to some of the, the, the comments that we've made earlier, um, if we're thinking about the most efficient places to be spending your money, um, you want to be measuring that based off of vehicle sales. So um, I, I urge you, if you haven't done so already, speak to your uh, account manager and and run a sales match. Um, let us help you understand how much influence we have over, over some of those vehicle sales, because at the end of the day, uh, that's how we all get judged, both uh, internally at AutoTrader, obviously, um, externally through through your dealership. So um, I really urge you to, to take advantage of the program. It's free. Um, and and it will um, ideally it'll help you kind of understand um, where that next incremental dollar should be spent. Um, so uh, I, I think that's that's one of the big things that I would I really want to kind of get out there today. Yeah, and, and, you, know, you know I think it's going to be especially fascinating. I mean obviously you know you've been running match for for well over kind of uh, 16, 1700 rooftops I think now um, over the past year or so, but. It's going to be really fascinating, you know, when we do come out of this, and we and we will come out of this, you know, we all agree, as, as you said, Matt. I think the match reports then kind of looking back at how this whole thing played out will be really fascinating because you, you know, of course, you'll be able to see sort of when do they start searching, when do they engage, okay, when do they transact, and and how does that look uh, throughout this whole thing, and you know, some of the hypothesis that we have around, you know, that they're researching, but they will buy, or maybe we'll find actually no, no, you know, they won't buy. I think it's going to be interesting and it's going to be so much learning for, I mean, God forbid we never have to go through this again, but it's going to be good learning for as and when, you know, something else, something else could happen in the future. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing those results and obviously they'll take two or three months to actually mature so we can see them. But uh, yeah, I think that's great. Um, and so Jody, I think uh, lastly, we'll come to you on, on the outlook. Sure. Thanks, Ian. So, um, you know, I don't think that, anyone's in a position in North America to really predict how long this is going to last. Um, I think it changes day to day based on, you know, the testing analytics that we're getting. But I agree with Matt that, that the auto industry is a very resilient bunch of people. And that when we do come out of this, that, that they will still be standing um, and they'll be able to tell the story of the journey um, for this unique situation that we're all experiencing. Um, but I think in the meantime, it's really important to be vigilant about where you're spending your money, where you're getting the best uh, bang for your buck, where are you getting your inventory in front of the most eyeballs, um, what kind of tools are you putting in place for consumers to really meet their needs um, in, this, in this time, um, and really training your sales staff on how to deal with the new realities, the, some of the stuff that we talked about, so that when we do come out of this, whenever that is, that your business is, is ahead and not scrambling to catch up to those that have, done, have put those best practices in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, um, that comes to the end of our questions and I wanna thank you guys for joining me today. I think it's been fascinating. I've certainly, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from getting your perspectives and um, so I imagine that the, uh, the people watching will as well. So uh, thank you, Matt. Thanks, Nuno. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for having me. And thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess the last kind of uh, wrap up to say for me is, um, you know, we, we at Trader, I mean, we, we're as passionate about business as anybody. And as Matt alluded to, you know, we obviously we, we work with, uh, you know, dealers and, and people in the industry every single day. And we know what kind of passion all you guys have as well for this industry. Um, but all that said, you know, that is always secondary to you know, your personal health and, and, and the health and happiness of, of your family and whatnot. Business does come second in this case. So do stay safe. Um, don't take uh, any unnecessary risks or anything like that. We want to come out of this kind of as, as healthy as possible and, and keep that optimism going. So look after yourself and stay safe.
the other thing I would say is that um, we want to be doing more of these kind of videos, more of you know some of the insight and expertise that's within our business, as you've seen today. Um, and I know these guys are out on the road all the time meeting with dealer customers, and so you know, likely many of you, many of you know the, the guys already. But we want to be producing more video content. So um, if there's topics that you'd like to hear more about, then please leave them as a comment either on LinkedIn or YouTube, or, or speak to your account manager. Or if there's a particular um, area of the business that you're interested in or a person in the business that um, we could speak to and ask some questions. Um, we want to kind of make this more of a regular thing. So hopefully uh, there's some good engagement on this video and, and we will uh, we'll make that a reality. So that's all from us at Trader Corporation. Thank you very much for joining us for this uh, COVID-19 special video panel and thank you once again to you guys. This has been awesome. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Thanks Ian. Thank you. Thanks guys. Stay safe.